Good day. Today we're going to be doing the advanced airway video. So we're going to be talking about supraglottic devices, such as the eye gel that we have, and endotracheal intubation, which is the gold standard of airway management. So let's just start off with supraglottic devices. And we're going to talk about what, what do they do, how do they work, how do we insert them, what are the pros and cons. So a eye gel which is a type of supraglottic. So how does this work? It, so it fits, goes in through the mouth, into the mouth, and just sits below the glottic. This does not give you a perfectly controlled, protected airway, so this will maintain an airway, it will not protect. There are terminology for advanced airway, which is open, maintain, and protect. So an open airway is, you can do a head tilt, that's an open airway. We can put in a OPA, that's an open airway. But it, now, what is maintain and protect? So a maintained airway, if I do a head tilt chin-up, that's not necessarily a maintained airway because I am maintaining it manually. If I put in a OPA and it is then open and maintained, it's being maintained by an OPA or oropharyngeal airway. Same thing goes for the eye gel. If this is in, we have an open and maintained airway, but not a protected airway. They can still aspirate through an eye gel or any other kind of LMA. The LMA is just a different kind of supraglottic device because it's a laryngeal mask. It's a mask that fits over the larynx. These mannequins need a bit of lubrication, so we're gonna normally use KY jelly. This is obviously a plastic mannequin. So how do we insert this device? How do we know we got the right size? So this is a two and a half, uh, the size of a two and a half, which says 25 to 35 kilograms. So if we have a 25 to 35, probably a child um, or a small adult, here we get bigger ones. This is the biggest one we have. This is a size five. This is for a 90 plus kilogram adult. So that's a big adult. I don't even weigh 90 kilograms. That's probably too big for me. What you want to do is you want to do a head tilt, chin lift. If you can, obviously if you have to do trauma, then you can't. And you want to slide it down the hard and soft palate of the mouth. So once it's in the, the mouth, slide it down the back. And once you can't slide anything, then you apply pressure. And there we go. So then you might ask, how do we know if it's in the right place? Well, once we start ventilating, we'll get to that. So a stethoscope, you're wanting to listen to the lungs. Once you have your eye gel in, we're gonna first attach our capnography, which should be as close to the patient as possible. Our catheter mount, then you can attach your HME filter. We have the capnography as close as we can to the patient because we want the most accurate reading. The Thomas tube holder gets attached like this and then gets around like that. Like that. And there you have it. So that is your Thomas tube holder with your capnography, your catheter mount, and your HME filter attached to your BBM. So today we're going to be talking about endotracheal intubation. We're going to talk about the pros and the cons. How do you do it? We will be referring to intubating a patient who is in cardiac arrest, not any sort of drug-facilitated intubation such as RSI. So let's go through the pieces of equipment. Uh, what do you need? What's this process? So endotracheal intubation is as it sounds. So there's endotracheal. So this goes into the trachea. How does that work? So if you look at our airway module here, the tracheal tube goes through past the tongue and goes into the trachea where it gets lodged. You're then going to put air into this cuff. And what that does is it then gives you a protected and maintained airway. As you can see, if they're vomiting or if there's blood in the airway, blood is not going to get past this tube. You can have micro aspirations, but in terms of protecting the airway, this is the gold standard. This cuff can be inflated slightly. It really doesn't need a lot of air. There's a pressure gauge to use to then monitor that pressure. The purpose of the cuff is not to stop the tube from moving. The purpose of the cuff is to stop blood and liquid to get past, to stop aspiration. And it also allows us to have higher pressures on the ventilator. So if you have an eye gel, such as this, there is no cuff, there is no protection from aspiration. And so what happens is that if you have high um, airway pressures, this is just going to leak, where this does not leak. You can give much higher pressures, which is obviously good for patients who need it, but also gives that risk of now we can hyperventilate someone um, with too much pressure and too much volume, which is a really big problem. So let's get into the equipment that is needed. So the first thing you obviously need is a tube. So this is a cuffed tube. Some tubes come uncuffed. See the cuff is on the end. If I inflate, see here that there is a cuff on the end. This can be tested before it's used. It's debatable if the manufacturer, when they put it in the bag, it is tested. So not necessarily needed to be tested. We have a cuff. 
and we have a little syringe which is then attached to that cup. If you don't have a syringe, you can't inflate this. The number one rule of intubation is being prepared. You need to be prepared and the patient needs to be prepared. So we have a tube and a syringe. This goes on your right hand side because that is where our hand is. What else do we need? All right, we need something to tie the tube down. This is just a Thomas tube holder, which we use for the eye gel, which we also use for the tube. We need a laryngoscope. So here we go. Here is a Mac size four blade. So Mac is the curved one, and then you have a Miller, which is the straight. You do get flat Miller blades for an adult. They're these massive blades. They can be used, they use slightly differently. This one you go straight down the middle of the tongue and you lift up. Uh, this one you go to the side and you actually push the tongue out of the way and then you lift up. So slightly different. Um, some people prefer the straight, some people prefer the curve, but normally the adult gets the curve. So you have your blade and your handle. So this is direct visualization. So, and what that means is that we are visually directly seeing it. So you can have video laryngoscope where you're using a video and you're not directly seeing it. This is direct visual laryngoscopy. See there's a little bulb here. Good to put some pressure on you and see if the bulb stays on, which it does. This goes on your left hand side because it's a left hand device. I believe you do get right handed devices. We have our BVM which has our HME filter and our um, catheter mount and our capnography, all very vital. The other thing that is super vital is suction. Suction, where does suction go? Under the right shoulder. Why under the right shoulder? Because that's the hand that's free. While I'm intubating and my blade is in the mouth, my right hand can grab the suction and I know where it is. We're not going into the mouth going, oh, I need suction now, stopping, pulling out, going on our business. While this is in the mouth, the patient's not getting ventilated. So it's important that we're quick and we're successful on the first try. Got our tube. This is a size seven and a half. So on the tube, it'll tell you the size. Over here, it says um, ID, which stands for internal diameter of 7.5. So the internal diameter of this tube is 7.5, which is pretty typical for an adult. The bigger the tube, the more air can move through it. But the bigger the tube, the harder it is to get into the trachea. Then. A really, really important piece of equipment is called the bougie or the gum elastic bougie, depending on like the, the, the brand or the name, they're all slightly different, but the first one to make it was the, was the gum elastic bougie, was the first bougie from my understanding. This is to assist intubation. When we are looking down the airway at the vocal cords, you have different view of the vocal cords. If you get a view of grade one, means that you can see the vocal cords while you are trying to intubate. A grade four means that you can almost see nothing and that means that you have a really bad view. This we pass through the mouth and into the trachea, and then we then railroad, we put the tube over that and we railroad it down the bougie. I would highly recommend you using the bougie for every intubation. This is proven to work and to improve our first pass success. That means that we improve patient safety. Bougie should be done with two people, but I'll show you how to do that. So we got our equipment, our intubation equipment, our BVM, our suction, our catheter mount. All right, so how do we intubate? So the blade goes in your left hand. I'll demonstrate quickly with this mannequin. This obviously is on my right hand. So the blade's gonna come down the right hand side of the patient and you're going to scoop the tongue and your tip of the blade needs to go into the vellecula, which is this little spot over here. So there is the epiglottis. It goes in between the tongue and the epiglottis. And then what you do is you pull up. You see here that when I pull up, suddenly your, your view of that gets much better. But we're not doing this. Remember, that's a fulcrum, which I'll show you now. This is what you want to do is lift up. The other way that you can do it, so typically speaking, there's two ways. So either you kind of go down the mouth slowly, lifting, 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 seeing your spot, and then you got it. Or you can go all the way in deep and then lift out slowly, lift out slowly, and then you get the vellecular and the epiglottis where you wish you're then able to lift. So what's really important is that I am comfortable and the patient is comfortable. The two best things that you can do for any intubation is to lift the patient's head, all right? This doesn't mean doing this. You want the patient's face to be parallel with the roof. So putting something under their head like a pillow or something like that, that lifts the head and then keeps the head flat. Obviously, if there's a spinal injury, this is not possible. So the first thing is to lift the head, keep the ear above the sternal notch, which is what we've done, which is going to improve a view, keeping the face flat with the roof because the angle that I need to see has become less. The other thing that you can do, which is hard to demonstrate here, is to then make the patient sit in a semi-fowler. So if they are on a bed, you can sit them up, which then makes the view that much better. I am positioned right. Having the patient at this level is the right level. If they're too low down or if they're too high up, we're gonna have a much harder time. 
So we can go into the mouth. We, can, we should go in with our suction in hand because if there's any blood or vomit, we can suction it first. All right, so I'm gonna go in slowly. How's my view? Cool, I have a grade one view. So you see now, the thing is that you're not doing this. See, that actually doesn't make my view any better. Let's see if I do that. There we go, really good view. So suction, I can now see the vocal cords, I can suction the hypopharynx. Now, I'm wanting to use the bougie. This should be a two-person process. So I lost my view there a little bit. All right, there we go. Cool, I can definitely see it going through the vocal cords. So this should be a two-person process, but you can do it by yourself. You can either railroad or have it preloaded. There we go. So don't be tempted to pull your blade out of the mouth. You can just push like this. And there we go. And we know that because this bougie is in the trachea, that the, that the tube will go into the trachea. This is a size seven, seven and a half, so we should go three times the internal diameter, so that's seven, 14, 21. But between 21 and 23 is fine. Cool, that's at 21. So bougie out, hold the cuff, hold the tube, sorry, inflate the cuff. So now that that is in, we want to then attach our BVM, which is connected already to our capnography, and it's all sorted, organized, ready. Now comes another conversation about where do we listen. So there are multiple thoughts, different opinions. Um, you can either just listen to the lungs and see if it's in. A really safe way, in my opinion, is to listen to the stomach. So we put the stethoscope over the stomach, and we ventilate. <laughs> right. So why do we do that? If I'm listening over the stomach and I ventilate, and the endotracheal tube is in the stomach, we will just hear bubbles in the stomach, which then we know immediately on the first ventilation that we are in the stomach, all right? We're also gonna start seeing capnography. So we don't want to put the tube in, ventilate a couple of times, wait for the capnography to pop up, and it doesn't pop up, and now we've put like four or five ventilations into the stomach. That's a big problem. Air in the stomach is going to promote the chance of um, vomiting, aspiration, and it's gonna make ventilation harder because the diaphragm can no longer move properly. So your first ventilation is on the stomach, it's clear, no sound in the stomach, so we know that it's in the trachea. We then it's in the left lung. Why the left lung? Because if there is no noise on the left lung, it's probably gone down the mainstream bronchi because that's more likely to where it's gonna go if it's too deep. But if I can hear air on the left, then I'm probably going to be able to hear air on the right. Then I listen to the right, and I can hear air on the right. So if I can hear left and right, then I know I'm in the right place, I know my depth is correct, and I know I'm not in the stomach because I've listened, and by the time you've given your third or fourth ventilation, you'll start seeing your capnock. Now you've confirmed placement. Now that we know that it's in, it's really important to hold, all right? Don't hold properly, so we don't hold up like this, where when the ambulance is moving and the patient's moving, you can dislodge the tube easily by extending or flexing your neck. Your hand should be on the patient, I'll just demonstrate on this side, hand is on the patient's face, and you're holding like that. Kind of like a CE grip, but you're holding the tube. Well, it's normally my left hand because I'm right-handed. Now I know that even if the patient moves, my hand is not moving, all right? Really important. Cool, now let's attach the Thomas tube holder. Just checking the depth before it goes in, because that's a really common time for it to slip a little bit deeper, which is going to cause issues later on. And there we go. So it is connected, and I have ventilation. If it goes too deep, you'll have one lung that will be inflating, which will most likely be the right lung. I can demonstrate quickly what it looks like if it goes too deep. See now how the tube has gone too deep and is now ventilating one lung. So if we were listening with our steth, listen to the stomach, then we'll have no sound. Listen to the left, we'll have no sound. Listen to the right, we know we have sound, which means we know that it's too deep. The way you deal with this is that you just deflate the cuff just a little bit, bring it out to the correct depth. So 7, 14, 21, 22, cool, 22 is good. Let's try ventilate. Both have now got chest rise. That is the process of intubation.